able to raise, who will be able to hold out and hold forth the word of life, shining as light in this crooked and perverse generation. We yet again ask that you please draw us in. We ask that you show us mercy as we study. And as we take some live examples, Lord, we pray that our understanding will be again enlarged. Just to have an understanding of what to do and how to do things that you have called us to do. To the glory and praise of your name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. In our study, we shall now take the examples of uh, disciples that walked in this path. And how did they come about it? So that again, while we are talking about raising hands to labor for the coming move, the coming revival, and for the body of Christ, despite all the challenges that we have, uh, we have people that stood in the course of time. We have people that walk with God and what God did in their lives. So the examples that are standing out for us in Philippians chapter 2 and chapter 3 is the examples of uh, Paul, the example of Timothy, and we have seen the example of Epaphroditus. So I'd like to ask us to look at this together and see how uh, God will have us uh, walk uh, even in these lives particularly. Now, let's look at it from verse we are reading from verse 19, and I'll get to the end of this chapter, and then we'll go to chapter 3 eventually. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. For you know his own proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, nor regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. So that takes us to chapter 3. So but let's quickly begin by looking at these uh, examples of disciples, uh, brothers, uh, in the Lord, who stood up, who became, you know, a blessing and one we can look at uh, even as we pursue our own growth in the Lord and our work with God. Now, the first of these examples that we're looking at is Timothy. And what about Timothy? Uh, because as you take time to study, the scriptures, especially as we keep looking at uh, 
raising disciples and calling disciples and bringing them up to become useful in the hand of God. The life of Timothy under the hand of Paul comes out very strongly. And at various times, we had alluded onto different discipleship relationship in scripture. And this, again, uh, was going to give us an opportunity of seeing how they grew, how they built up discipleship in their own time. And before I go into looking at the life of Timothy and the testimony we are getting out of his life in these few verses here, I like also to keep noting that uh, all of them are disciples of Christ and all of them are designing to become like no one else but Jesus Christ. But then we find that in God's provision, he raises hands, he raises what we have been referring to as human disciples or disciples who can help make other disciples. Uh, that is the pattern we have found in Christ Jesus. They go ye into the world and make disciples of all nations. So disciples that have been made or disciples that have been helped in their own way are also uh, commissioned to go and help make other disciples. And you will see that that chain is a continuous chain in the word of God. We find that because Jesus Christ wanted to affect the entire world, he was not globetrotting, he was not going all over the world. What he simply did was that he, he, he focused, he selected people that he could work with, that he could pour his life into. And he said, go you also and make disciples. What I've taught you, what I've shown you, go and do it to others. That was their commission. So first I would like to say that in the process of all we are talking about facing the challenge and uh, uh, standing out as shining light in this crooked and perverse generation, the process of production, reproduction of disciples never stopped. The process of raising men, replacement sons, those who can take the uh, batting further never stopped and this we must commit ourselves unto doing as the lord grants us opportunity as the lord helps us from one point to another that we're going to have uh, a multiplication of disciples is again the same process one telling the other what god has done in his life one asking can you be with me for this time just like that they started one after another, one by one, one by one, until they became a, a, a great host uh, in the hand of God. It's the same process that we're seeing here. So let's look at how Timothy had come into the life and into the relationship and discipleship with uh, Brother Paul said, let me read on again from verse 19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me, in the gospel. Now, that's the first uh, point I want us to quickly note. Uh, Timothy, we're seeing here that as a son with his father, he has served with me in the gospel. He has served with me in the gospel. Paul was testifying. Now, first and foremost, let's note that the son with his father we're noting here is not a biological relationship. It is a relationship in the gospel. And more and more as you look at scriptures, you will see that 
So that relationship is not about a, a title. It's not about nomenclature. It's not about saying uh, Father Paul. It's not about, it's a relationship that does not need labeling. It's a living and a lively relationship. A relationship of that we can liken to father and son in actual sense of relationship. Now we don't want uh, it to be misconstrued as another hierarchical status or title that is setting up in between the brothers and sisters who are relating together in their discipleship. The word that we are noting is the relationship. And I want you to see, say, as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. But when you go to the beginning of the chapter, I mean, of the book, you will notice that Paul uh, was introducing this book in chapter 1, verse 1. He said, Paul and Timothy, born servants of Jesus Christ. So even though the relationship between Paul and, and, and Timothy in actual sense is like a son serving with his father in the gospel. Yet when Paul was going to write this letter, he wrote this letter, he said, Paul and Timothy, born servants of Jesus Christ. So again, the relationship in discipleship, even though it could be son-father relationship in terms of the actuality of relationship, but in the body of Christ, we are brothers. We are brothers and sisters. And we are born servants of Jesus Christ. So the idea of, oh, that's my son, that's my son. And then you say, son, stand up. No, it is not the, that's not how they practiced in the New Testament and the Word of God. Though, yes, God might use a brother to bring up another brother as though he was playing a fatherly role on his life when he was bringing him up. But this brother is a brother in the Lord. This brother is a brother in Christ Jesus. So we are actually brothers and we are actually born servants of Jesus Christ. So when we are talking of raising disciples, let's keep knowing that Disciples are basically disciples of Christ. Disciples are not, uh, they are not the exclusive possession of those that God used to raise them. So a discipler does not have the possessive right over a disciple and say, I'm the one who raised you up. You can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. No. Even when we have been of help, we have raised people for Jesus, at best we become brothers. At best we become fellow servants. At best we become yoke fellows in the call of God or in the gospel. We must keep noting that. And we must keep making sure that this discipleship as God is raising among us and as we are reaching out to souls and to people we can give fatherly care. We can give fatherly role. Yet that does not confer upon us to become their father. The Bible says, call no man your father on earth, for we have only one father. And call no man your master on earth, for we have only one master, which is Jesus Christ. You are brethren. So this must continue to be clear even as we continue to build and raise men for God in discipleship. Now, discipleship must not become a loyalty cult. It must not be a, personal, a personality cult. It must not become, you know, the heavy shepherding where you possess the life of the other person, where the other person has lost a sense of directly having his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and building a relationship with Christ and growing. 
disciples or the brothers that are making disciples at best we are helpers helpers of these other brothers joy we are friends of the bridegroom who only rejoices when the bride and the bridegroom connects and once we have done that we must continue to decrease so that christ continuously increase in the lives of men in the lives of women that god is using us to affect for god now i'm needing to put all of this across because i knew many many years ago when god was visiting united kingdom perhaps in the late 50s and in the early 60s the law was coming and the need for raising disciples was i mean came up the the idea of raising disciples was correct but then as usual the natural man mr flesh i jacked it i jacked it to such a point that it became like a possessive relationship it becomes like an exclusive relationship it becomes like oh you belong to me you don't go anywhere else it becomes what many people now refer to as heavy shepherding where this the disciples seem not to have his individual right and relationship with god anymore and it robs him of his individual liberty to work with god now that's an aberration that set back you mean it's a setback on what god started doing in that time i still met brothers and sisters when i started coming to the uk to uh, speak about restoration of revival i still met people who were of that experience and who say yes billy do you know what we have known about this before but we don't want any of it because of this effect because of this challenge that it came about but you don't throw the baby away with the bath water the need for us to go back to scriptures and see that this is a biblical option this is what jesus practiced this is what the apostles practiced this is what he told us to actually go and do every scripture you will be reading you will see it there I see yes there's something that God has said to be done and I want to quickly using the example of Timothy and Paul here to illustrate discipleship in its essence and how to go ahead with it it doesn't have to be too elaborate yet each one of us will take responsibility of trusting God to raise hands for God as we have been helped we will help others to the extent to which God has helped you, you will help someone else. Why we don't break discipleship relationship as a relationship? We don't stop touching other lives for God as the Lord gives us the opportunity. Now let's quickly look at the Timothy illustration as we are going on here. Uh, the first uh, time that the Bible mentioned about Timothy and Paul is somewhere in Acts chapter 16. Let me quickly ask you to check Acts chapter 16 and see how it came about. I decided to give attention to this today because I sense that as we read scriptures, as we study, we'll be looking at biblical examples of how to do what God is actually asking us to do, even in the context in which we now live. In Acts chapter 16, then came he to Dabe and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him, would Paul have to go forth with him? And he took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. 
And as they went through the uh, cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. So were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Now, that chapter uh, gives to us the beginning of relationship between Timothy and uh, Paul and the context in which Timothy came into relationship with Paul is what we are finding here. Now we are told that Paul came to Dabe and to Lystra uh, in his usual way as he went about preaching and uh, ministering and establishing and confirming the brethren everywhere they had gone to preach. He went through Syria, went through Cilicia, confirming the churches. Then he came to Dabe and Lystra. And when he came there, there was a certain disciple there named Timotheus. So we found that Timothy had been uh, born again, so to say, and he had been in the fellowship, he had been in the midst of the brethren. And his name, everybody knew him, he was a son of a certain woman which was a Jewess. It was later on we found in the book of uh, First Timothy and Second Timothy a little more about his life background, where Paul was talking about the faith which was in his mother Eunice and in his grandmother uh, Lois, which meant then that uh, this young man, Timothy, had been growing, he had a kind of background from his mother and grandmother. And everybody knows and knew him. He had a good report. He had a good report. So again, we want to know that there is no gain saying about exposing our young people, exposing our children, uh, grandmothers, mothers, showing interest in their uh, grandchildren, or in their children uh, as to expose them to the Lord. So Timothy was one of such. So Timothy had a kind of background from home. But now there has come a point in which God wants to offer him, you know, a more specific and a more intentional discipleship. And we saw Paul coming in. And the Bible said, Paul would like to have uh, Timothy to go forth with him. Now that may look abroad, but it's not. Because when you look at how Jesus Christ called disciples, how he called them to go with him or to follow him, and how in time uh, people like Peter were also going with people, so it was not strange that people can uh, uh, go with someone in discipleship, in training. Uh, even Paul, before he came to know Christ, in the custom of the Jews, they have a kind of training, a kind of discipleship of their own kind. So we talk about John. He had his own disciples. They say we are the disciples of John. Some say we are the disciples of Moses. So. The, the context of someone who has an understanding of the scripture and of the Lord seeking to help someone else in a deliberate manner, in a very concerted manner. Unlike we just find ourselves, oh, we're, we're all in church and nobody takes particular attention of any. When the concept of discipleship and discipling got lost, then everything got lost into congregation where we only come, we worship, we sing, and nobody takes particular care of a particular life and say, please, can I walk with you? Can I, can I relate with you with a view of establishing you, with a view of making you to grow much more in Christ? Now, so I found that here we found Timothy was already in a congregation, but Paul coming in will have him to go with him, 
will have him to spend time with him, will have him to travel with him. And when it was discussed, because the young man had good report, even in the community, uh, they were going to release him, but for him to be able to follow Paul to everywhere Paul needed to go, he being a Greek, Paul will not be able to take Timothy being a Greek into every congregation because as of that time, the Jews who are Christians are still struggling with the custom of circumcision or no circumcision. Even though in the new creation, in Christ Jesus, circumcision or uncircumcision does not mean much. What matters is the new creation. But for Brother Paul to be able to have the liberty to travel with uh, Timothy everywhere, Timothy was uh, made to be circumcised so that if they went into a Jew's uh, uh, synagogue to preach or to share the word of God, nobody said, no, 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 why do you bring this uh, barbarian, this Gentile here? So Paul did that. Timothy submitted to that not so that he can be saved, not so that he can become a child of God, but so that he can, he can have the discipleship opportunity with Paul. So let's take note of this now. Discipleship in its essence is not first of all uh, forcing you to enter into another man's culture. It is not the culture of a disciple we come to learn. We are coming to learn Christ. And if it is Christ Jesus we are learning, Christ is found in every culture, in every situation we can trace Christ. So discipleship must not become, you know, a cultural context particularly. Because it is not the culture of people we are learning, it is Christ. And we don't have to become uh, the culture of that man before we can learn Christ. Because in Christ Jesus we are told that there is no Jew, there is no Greek, there is no barbarian, there is no Scythian. All there is is the new creation. So let's note that what we are talking about, every time we draw people into discipleship relationship, one thing must be very clear to us. It is that he might become conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. It is that Christ may be formed in him. It is that he may become matured in Christ Jesus. That he might be able to stand to bear Christ's life anywhere he goes. That is the first issue that we must not miss out here. But Timothy subjected himself to circumcision simply because of the convenience of him being having access onto Paul everywhere he was going. For example, Titus was also a Greek and Paul did not need to circumcise him. Titus did not need to be circumcised to be a disciple under Paul. The circumstance and the context does not warrant that. So let's take note of all of this as we go ahead. So we can see Paul raising disciples among Jews, raising disciples among the Greek, raising disciples among different people. But all of that makes no, no problem because the centrality of our discipleship is Christ. The one we come to know is Christ. The one we preach is Christ. So Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. So when we are sure about that, then we can quickly go ahead and look at how Timothy progressed in the relationship. First and foremost, you can see that Timothy was exposed to everything that Paul was going through. And if I would jump quickly, I wanted to look at uh, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy just to give us an insight into that example of uh, Timothy's life. 
Now, in First Timothy chapter one, verse one and two, let me let me pick that first before we go ahead. He said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God as Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, why was this done in First Timothy? This is a private personal letter to Timothy. If not because God had decided to honor it, that it now comes to a public space where we are reading it and it's a blessing to us. This letter is private. So this address unto Timothy, it was speaking to Timothy. He wasn't talking about uh, Timothy to someone else. He wasn't talking about, he wasn't talking to people. He was talking to Timothy, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. And to me, that kind of personal introduction is what we have written to one another from time to time. Oh, my dear friend in Christ Jesus, my bosom uh, uh, yoke fellow, all of this that we are free to express in relationship. So I realize that even as we are looking at how discipleship and disciples multiply, they multiply in the context of relationship. They multiply in the context of friendship. They multiplied in the context not of officiality. It's not the context of officialdom. It's a relationship, but with a defined focus. A relationship to labor on each other until Christ is formed in them. A friendship in order for Christ to be impacted onto the life of the other person. That was their relationship. So he could say, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ be unto you. And if you look at that, that is a personalized instruction that went through the whole of that uh, book, both the first and the second Timothy. Thank God that it gave us an illustration of how to relate with people that we are building up, we are relating with. When we can't sit down together, we can write. When we cannot have time to uh, move together or travel together, we can communicate. Uh, discipleship can continue even by communication. Discipleship can be built as a relationship. And you know, I was just checking. As I read through First Timothy, I saw a lot and lot and lot of instructions that Paul was giving to Timothy, was giving Timothy, you know, very critical instruction. You will see it uh, on and on and on. When you have time, uh, it's a book to study and just to see how they relate together, how they work together, how he gave instruction, this is how you should handle this, this is how you should handle that, concerning this case that you are asking me for, this is what to do. Private but instructional. Discipleship of pouring into people's lives for them to become what God wanted them to be in Christ Jesus. Now, by the time we now come to chapter 4, I want to note chapter 4, and I would like you to read verse 12, what he was saying to Timothy. Let no man despise your youth, for be thou an example of the believers, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in you, which was given you by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give yourself only to them, that your profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto yourself, and unto the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save yourself and them that hear you. Now I find that even when Timothy 
had been asked to now stay somewhere in Ephesus, his discipleship relationship with Paul did not stop. Now he has become a leader. He has been told now to, you know, set up elders and ordain leaders for the church at Ephesus. And he, he had that kind of uh, responsibility. Yet, Paul was still uh, ministering to his own life. Paul was still saying, take note of this, take note of this, take note of that, take note of that. Which means at no time can we say discipleship relationship stopped. But discipleship relationship does not make the disciple a puppet under the person that God is using to raise him. He does not tie him to his apron as if he cannot express what he has learned of Christ, you know, in other people's lives. So I wanted to note here that Timothy grew in discipleship with Paul. He grew in his relationship with him. He also grew himself in expressing discipleship to others. He also grew in becoming a leader that can raise others. And yet, while that is going on, his relationship with Paul in, in bringing further tutelage into his life did not stop. So now we come to chapter 2 that we have been reading in Philippians. And there was a need where Timothy was to be sent to the Philippian people to go and encourage them. And now look at, he said, I trust the Lord. I'm reading chapter 2, that verse 19 now. Please come with me there. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. So, number one, I'm saying that Timothy is a man that could be sent. A man that you can delegate to go and do something. So let's know that as we build people in discipleship, we should look forward to when we can send them, when they can go and take responsibility on our behalf, when they can go and stand in, even on your behalf, to do something in the build up and in the ministry of the gospel or in raising others for God. Timothy has become a man that can be sent. He said, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. That was very touching. Now, one of the things I found in their relationship is that they are so related in a manner that if Paul was doing something and he couldn't finish, he could call Timothy. Timothy, please go over to that place and finish what we started. Or if he had preached somewhere and there's need for follow-up, he could leave Timothy behind and say, Timothy, I'm leaving you in Ephesus so that you can set in order the things that are lacking or the things that we have not finished. So when discipleship is developing properly, people become useful, they become sendable. They can take responsibility. They can go and occupy a space in the purpose of God, and we are sure that by the grace of God, they will do well. Now, so if we are uh, going to raise people that are shining as shining stars, you know, in, the, in this present perverse uh, generation, we must make input into their lives. And the input we make into their lives, uh, I spoke yesterday, the input of the fellowship in the gospel, the input of prayer, praying into their lives, praying into their inner man, praying for them to be reinforced in the inner man, praying for Christ to be formed in them. The input of a worthy example, a worthy consecrated life that they can look up and say, ah, so that is it. The input of understanding that suffering is part of our calling. So that they are not afraid, they are not ashamed, they are not embarrassed if there is opposition. Now we are saying that there must be a continuous input of the, of the ministry of the word of God in their lives so that they can stand well. So I found that Timothy could be sent. Timothy can be delegated. 
Timothy can be left to handle a place. And we should look forward to that. We should look forward that if the Lord is helping us, we are sitting with two, three persons, we are praying together, we are studying the gospel together, we are uh, ministering together, we are traveling together. There must be a time when we can leave such people behind, when we can say, please go and do this, go and handle that, and they are laboring in the gospel. It is nothing new. It's not a different work they are doing. They are laboring in the gospel. It is this that we have experienced even in what God has called us to do over the years. There are people that we sat with, we, we lived with, we spent time with them in discipleship. Now by God's grace, they can be sent forth. They can go and stand in different places. Some are standing for us in Malawi. Some are standing for us in uh, Liberia, some have gone to be in Ghana, some have gone in different di direction, and they are doing well. And they are also raising disciples that are also sendable. We must keep at this chain, as we are seeing in the life of Timothy, under the hand of Brother Paul. Now, he said that I may also be encouraged when I know your state. Again, I'm seeing that there's a relationship, there's a fellowship, there's a passion. I want to know your state. I want to know how you are faring. Can you imagine that it was just to go and know the state of the Philippian brethren that Paul is saying, I want to send Timothy to just go and check how you are doing. So there is a relationship that is going on. There's a fellowship that is going on. There is there is a communion that is going on that you can see, you can touch in the New Testament. It is not stereotype. It is not like, oh, look, these are organizational greeds. It's a relationship. It's possible that I say, okay, uh, uh, James Verretti, you are very close to Manchester. Can you just uh, travel on our behalf to Manchester and check the brethren? How are they fearing? And please let me know their state. It shouldn't be strange if we are building relationship the way it should be built. It should be something that we should be looking forward to uh, by the grace of God. But there are two things or three things I want to highlight in the life of Timothy in this short testimony of his life. There are many other places we would have loved to go but because of the space that we have here, I want you to look at that. He said, for I have no one like-minded. I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. Wow. Which means that even in raising disciples, there are times that we will not succeed with every disciple we start with. And I'm hearing Paul speaking here. He said, yes, I have several others, but I don't have one whose mind is like mine, who has become almost like me, who carries the kind of mind, the kind of heart I have, you know, in the earlier part of this chapter, we are talking about let us have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now we are coming now in that verse 20, he was talking about, I have no one like-minded, which meant that Timothy had settled down in following Paul to learn the life of Christ and to cultivate that mind. It means that he had progressed deliberately in his own pursuit of Christ's life. That to this point, we can now say, he is a man of like mind. He is a man who will care sincerely for your state. So I saw in one word there, Timothy had grown to cultivate the mind of Christ and even the mind that Paul operates with. Now, discipleship, may I say, and it's very important here, 
does not begin with external conformity. It is not external uniformity that biblical discipleship is aiming at. It is internal transformation. He said, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So like-mindedness, the mind of Christ, is what we are longing that as we continue to study the word, as we continue to pray, as we continue to interact, as we continue to fellowship in the gospel, the mind of Christ is being formed, is being released, is being grown inside us as disciples. So it is not external conformity, it is not uniform that we are talking about, but we are talking about transformation that takes place from inside. He said, I don't have another person who is like-minded. He has caught my mind. He has understood my mind. He has known what is the rationale, the motive behind our action. This man has grown. So I want to note that when you look at Timothy, why is he able to interpret Paul and interpret the message of the cross accurately is because he himself had been transformed in his mind. And as I am talking here, I realize that by God's grace, as we have interacted with the word of God, as we have interacted in the new creation and all of that, we have seen Jesus forming his life in several people. And we have seen that by the grace of God, we won't say that, yeah, we have got all that we are looking for, but we have seen Christ at work in several lives. And we have seen God raising young people or Timothys that he can work with and send forth. Now, number two, still in that Bible verse, who will sincerely care for your state? There is something about sincerity in the life of Timothy. He was sincere. He wasn't doing it to impress someone else. He wasn't doing that in order to win the favor of the people. He was not looking for popularity. He was a sincere caregiver who will sincerely care for your state. He was sincere. So when we raise disciples, we will be looking at this aspect of their lives. Sincerity. In, 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 in caring for other lives. Sincerity in, in interpreting the word of God all the time because it has happened in their own lives. Now, when he contrasted Timothy, he said, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ. So is it possible that there are people that we may have trapped even into our relationship or into our fold, and yet, they are not seeking that which is of Christ. They are seeking their own. And they may appear to be submissive for a while, but they are doing so because they are planning that I will soon get my own. I will soon get my own. So they would like to build their own contact. They would like to build their own uh, uh, connections. And every opportunity they have, they don't only represent the entire thing that God is doing, but they are thinking about what they will get for themselves. And they are asking themselves, when will you prepare for your own? He said, hey, they do not seek things which are of Christ Jesus, but they are seeking their own. So I will say, oh, Paul, how did you know that? It means when we raise disciples, we are able to know of what sort of what quality they are. We are able to be able to say, okay, we are able to evaluate. This evaluation is not malicious. This evaluation that a disciple can have is not because he's vindictive. He's only being objective. He's just finding out. I can imagine that Demas was there. And Paul knew that Demas would seek his own. And Later on, we heard that Demas have left for Thessalonica because he loved this present world. So people that are self-willed, 
we can see them. Uh, Paul was talking about, about Apollos at a point. He said, yes, Apollo is good and all of that, but he has his own will. He can only go to where he says he wants to go in his own will. So eventually, before you know it, Paul, Apollos, Apollo was causing a kind of disaffection problem in Corinth. That Corinthians and say, we have Apollos, we have Paul, we have this, we have that. What is the cause of that? When a disciple quietly seeks his own, he might put a label, a demarcation on the lives of disciples that ought to have flowed together and relate together and grow together and learn Christ together. Without saying, but you belong to this one, you belong to that one, are you of that group, are you of that group? If we are growing well, we will be one in Christ Jesus and will be working for oneness as the Lord will help us. Now, Timothy was a man of proving character. People can prove it. It was not just that Paul is talking about him. He said, but you know his proving character. Which means even the community, the brethren, other people, they can prove the character of, of, uh, of Timothy. He said, you know him. You know him. You know he's a man of proving character. And you know that as a son with his father, he sat with me in the gospel. You knew that we traveled together. You knew that he, he labored with me when I came to you and all of that. So I saw that Paul could talk about Timothy this way. But when he first picked Timothy, he was looking like, oh, he's a boy he picked. But he labored on him until Timothy became a yoke fellow, a fellow servant. He labored with him until Timothy can be delegated to go and take leadership role in somewhere. He labored on him to a point that he could ask him also to go and raise elders. And he labored on him so much that when he was about to go, when Paul knew that my time of departure is at hand, you will notice that Timothy was one hand that he must have handed over to. He must have handed over several things he was doing to, including other disciples. He said, uh, tell, bring John Mark for me, uh, bring this one, look his up. So you can see that Timothy has now become a leader among others because he has followed. So I'm seeing an example of disciples here who took their stand, who walked with God, and a Timothy is one. But as we are looking at Timothy, we cannot but look at Paul that got used to racing, who said, I would like you to go with me. Now, I was ending the afternoon uh, before we came on this break. I said to offer, as we read in that scripture, he said, offering the word of life to many. Offer it. I found that we ought to also offer discipleship relationship to people. We find that Paul here offered it to Timothy. And Timothy was willing to come along. We find that Jesus offered discipleship to so many. But I must tell you the truth, it's not everybody to which Jesus offered discipleship that came. You remember the rich young ruler? What did Jesus offer him? He said, if you want to be perfect, if you want to really enter life, one thing that lackest, go and sell all that you have, distribute it to the poor that you may have uh, uh, treasures in heaven, and come, take up your cross and follow me. That was an offer. But that man did not agree. That man left sorrowfully. And Jesus did not feel bad. He just simply allowed him to go. And he continued talking to his own disciples who had agreed the offer of discipleship. Don't feel bad if you offer discipleship relationship to someone and he said, oh, no, 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 I'm not interested. There's no problem about that. You wouldn't have offered it to 20, 30 people before you get some that God 
will have called to come with you. And if you start sitting with lives, you start meeting with them, uh, if they are married, you and your wife, you are meeting with them as couple, and they are coming on together gradually. A state will come when you see the law breaking forth in their lives. And they may say, oh, the time you used to spend to all, with us is the most precious time in our lifetime. You will see that testimony coming. But when we don't offer it, when we thought they will not agree, we miss opportunities. So I saw again that discipleship must be offered to people. Jesus offered it to people. You may say, but in our culture, you don't tell people to follow you. You've not offered it. The truth is that even in that culture, as much as I know, people are following others. People are following people. Some of our sons are following some dangerous people because that one said, follow me, can we go out together? Let's hang out together. And they have gone out. And they are doing things. And before you know it, your own son is beginning to be, you know, strangely affected because somebody offered him. So we also need to boldly offer relationship, offer discipleship. I'm not talking about imposing ourselves. I'm not talking about not being polite. I trust that God will give you wisdom. He will give you light on what to do and how to do it. I'm not saying that, oh, everybody we speak to must count. They don't have to. But there will be some that say, oh, what you are saying, I want it. What you are saying, I like it. And I've done that severally as the Lord has granted me opportunity over time. I know I came over to uh, Izumel some years ago and I had to offer discipleship to a couple. And they decided to follow me up. And they came over and stayed with me, even in Nigeria. And by the grace of God, I'm still relating with them, even though they are back in their different uh, 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 assignment that God has given them to do. They are working with God. They are doing what they are doing. Occasionally, we meet. Occasionally, they call me up to give me a report. I like, believe really this what's happening to us. This is how God is helping us. We are involved in this. We are involved in that. I said, okay, that's all right. All I need is just to have men in the kingdom of God serving God. Even if they don't uh, come to work with me directly, there's no problem. Let them be in the kingdom. Let them be in the vineyard. Let them be serving the Lord. Let them be affecting others. Let them be multiplying the kind of thing that God put in their own lives. Let them be multiplying it. If it be worthy of the gospel of Christ, that's okay. That's okay. So Timothy became a vessel. Timothy became a minister. Timothy became a yoke, a true yoke fellow. Because Timothy was offered discipleship and he took it. And he took it. Now, the next example we want to talk is again in that chapter 2, Epaphroditus. Yet, in verse 25, I consider it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, and my fellow soldier. Again, something touches me about Paul that I need to highlight here in raising disciples. Discipleship as a relationship does not fail to take cognizance of the preciousness of the brothers and sisters we are relating with. It does not fail to venerate the virtues, the competencies in the different lives that God is asking us to raise for Him. We may not yet be perfect in our conformity to Christ's life, but a disciple should recognize the progress that disciples are making and be able to speak, you know, positively about it. And I saw this several in the life of Paul. I found that if you read, if you take time to read epistles of Paul, you will notice that he particularly mentions people's names. He mentions what they do, 
He mentions how they helped him. He mentions different persons' names as in the context in which he met them, which means it's a relationship, which means not just an officiality. It means he has a heart for people. He knows their names. He knows what they have done. And he recognizes, he appreciates it. He sends what I would call a, a complimentary letters. He will send a, letters of appreciation and all of that to people as he went about. So I realized that to be in discipleship is to build relationship. And we can build relationship for Christ's sake. Can build relationship that will further the gospel can build relationship and I think I want to challenge us in the course of this meeting today that we should explore your capacity to build relationship. The only thing I want you to do is that build that relationship with a focus that we will pour it into Christ. That we will use it to raise people for Christ. We will build relationship that will help people to find their feet in Christ Jesus and to grow in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, my brother, when he said, my brother, again, I want you to know that that brotherhood that he's talking about is not blood brotherhood. Epaphroditus did not, was not related in any physical manner with Paul. It is their relationship in the gospel. He said, my brother, so every time, every time uh, uh, people uh, respond to me and say, oh, my brother, something jumps up in my heart. Like, yes, yes, I belong to this brother. And this brother belongs to me. Now, that shows a level of intimacy, a level of fellowship that Paul was having with Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker. You recognize that they are working together. That this brother is a fellow in the work, fellow worker and fellow soldier. I don't know how to uh, speak much about this within the space of time I have, but I realize that discipleship and discipling people must not be in an arbitrary context. It must carry, you know, an atmosphere of relationship, atmosphere of of, of fellowship, atmosphere of, of recognition, of competence, of sacrifice, of what people are contributing to what we are doing. We must recognize that. We must speak about it. We must not be stingy with our commendation when we see something good happening in the life of disciples. He said, this brother is my brother, my fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Again, which meant Epaphroditus was sent from the Philippians to come and minister to the need of Paul while he was in prison. So again, he said, look, it's your messenger you sent to me to come and minister to my need. But since he came, he has been much more than that to me. He has become a fellow soldier with me, a fellow worker with me, and is actually my brother. And he had been longing for you all. Again, why am I bringing a Epaphroditus out here? He's a man of passion. He has a heart for the brethren. He has a heart for them, you know. You go on reading and reading from scripture. You see Paul talking about such persons. You know that when he's writing to a, uh, the Colossian church, he talks of another man called Epaphras. Say Epaphras has been laboring in prayer for the church at Colossae. So, which means this discipleship, it carries different, 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 different mode, different form, and different uh, practicality. Now, Epaphroditus, yeah, the Bible said he was longing, even though he was sick. Yet his heart was with the brethren. I want to see how they are doing. I want to go and check whether they are still standing in the faith. 
I want to renew my relationship with them. Paul said, indeed, he was sick. He was sick unto death, almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. You know, what I'm seeing here is fellowship. I'm seeing a loving relationship. I'm seeing, you know, a relationship of people that are bonding together, relating together. When somebody is sick, he touches the other brother, and he says, oh, no, 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 if that brother died, the sorrow you have left me will have been so much. I don't even know how I will cope. That kind of relationship. I pray that as we go on as disciples in different places, let the note of love, let the note of oneness, let the note of fellowship, let the note of bonding, let the note of care, the note of standing together, let it continue to be the manifest, the manifest feature of our relationship. Let our relationship begin to show this forth all the time, everywhere. This itself is going to be the, the means by which we'll be able to stand and attract more people to the kingdom and attract more people to be discipled and to be raised for God. Now, this, as I look at him, he said, this man, this man, he cares so much for you. So I need to send him the more he can, so that when you see him again, you are saying, may rejoice. And you may know that God has kept him. So, you know, I'm looking at disciples all over the place. There is that bond. Uh, when we shall be concluding this moment, I'm trusting that I'll be asking John, maybe towards the end of our meeting when he's bringing closing remarks and announcement for us to pray. For us to pray for one thing that is recurrent in this meeting. The bond of love. Those of us that are attending this uh, Disciple Summit and those that we have related with who may not be here today, can we trust God that we will raise up a bond of love, a bond of oneness, a bond of unity, a caring atmosphere that people know that, yes, somebody cares for me. Somebody is thinking about me. So that even we can take time, we can take transport to go and visit and say, we just want to check on you. We learned that you were sick some time ago. We want to see how you are doing. And all of that, that gradually was beginning to be eroded off from the life of God's people. We are praying that God will restore it to us in the name of Jesus Christ. He said, receive him. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness. And hold such men in esteem. Wow. Discipleship must give opportunity for us to also express appreciation to men who are serving God, who are laying down their lives. He said, hold such men in esteem because for the work of Christ, he came close to death. And Paul was talking about another brother, Epaphroditus, not about himself. So I can see that anybody who is in the work, anybody who is in the discipleship, move among them. The brethren everywhere, they responded to them. They responded to their need. They responded to their care. Said so because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life. To supply what was lacking in your service towards me. Now, that's the kind of thing we are looking at in the life of Epaphroditus. So, again, you are seeing different, different people that did uh, discipleship. Now, I could not talk about uh, Paul without talking about Luke. Luke was a medical doctor, as we all know. But what is standing to the credit of a man like Luke? When you go to the book of Luke chapter 1, 
Please, let's quickly look at Luke chapter 1 and see the example of another, uh, you say, silent disciple, but his name had not become known because he did quiet things and yet. Now, in Luke chapter 1, please, verse 1, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth or to set in order, to set forth in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, they delivered them to us. Verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. For what reason? Verse 4 now. That you may know the certainty of those things which you are instructed. Now, I want you to get the picture. Look was only writing to a brother, maybe a young convert called Theophilus. And that the purpose of doing that is that he was setting in orderly account the things that God has been doing in the midst of the disciples so that Theophilus can have a more certainty of what he has been instructed in. Now, Luke did not expect that this book, this letter he wrote to Theophilus, would be published in the Bible. He didn't know about that. He was writing to an individual. So when you talk about how did they labor in discipleship, the truth of the matter is that not all of them stood on the pulpit to raise disciples. Some of them, all he did was to this brother, just sat down and wrote like a follow-up note to a man called Theophilus to set in order as much as he knew so that this man can have a more certainty of the things in which he had been instructed or the things in which he had believed. They were laboring just for one man to stand well in Christ. What kind of discipleship labor is that? If we look at people the way they labor, then you will understand that the contribution unto the purpose of God in their own time is so interesting that if we will become selfless, there's so much to do. There's so much we can do. Now, I saw that when Timothy, when uh, Theophilus had been instructed in that, Luke did not stop there. Look at Acts chapter 1. Let's read Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. You will see again. Now, Acts 1, the former treatise or the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to teach, to do, and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, which means the whole book of Acts was again a personal account that brother Luke was writing to establish a convert called the Theophilus. What kind of work is that? How many of us will deliberately say, look, Lord, I want this brother to stand well. I want this girl to find Christ well. And all you do is to engage in a constant letter or a constant account of the things. For example, someone sit down and say, oh, let me even transcribe what we have done during this disciple summit so that I can do the summary of it and send it maybe as a newsletter to one person or to two person or to three person 
that they may know what God is doing in our midst. Would that be a way of extending the work? To send notes, notes that can help other lives, other people, and say, I, I knew you couldn't come for that meeting, but these are the uh, gist of what God told us. And this is the area that affected me. I just decided to share that with you. Could that begin to raise relationship that will increase disciples in the land? So I saw that there's a look. Do a doctor. He could have been doing his medical practice, but see what he was doing here. And everybody knew him as a beloved physician because he was still practicing. And yet, see what he was doing here. See how it was because of his instrumentality that we now have the book of Luke. He wrote it to one man, but I don't know how many millions of souls have been brought to the kingdom of God because of the gospel of Luke. And I don't know how many of us have been deeply affected over the years reading the book of Acts. But here is just what a brother did for one soul. Will you think you are wasting your time if you focus on one soul or two souls or three souls? Even if we just decide and say, Lord, what you are showing us, I want to engage myself in it. I want to walk in the reality of it. I want to be involved. I want to touch life. And if you know that the children you gather today at the age of 10, 12, in another 10 years, they are in their 20s. They are young adults. They get married. And they will go on in life. How dare we think that those ones that we are dealing with now in the primary school or in the early secondary school, how dare we forget that they are shooting forth and they may become the carriers of the message that we are talking about today. So I want to again say that the way I saw them practice discipleship in the New Testament, some did it by writing, some did it by, you know, drawing some younger people with them, some are grandmothers and mothers who just decided to raise a Timothy, waiting for another hand to help them and to move them forward. And there are several others that God used in different ways. Those that were only providing lunch, when people gather for meetings, the Bible mentioned them. Those who ministered to Jesus out of their substance as he traveled about. There are some women that were always going around with him to supply their needs. They were all mentioned in scripture and they are all part of that ministry that has brought salvation to mankind. Can we ask God that even as we are looking at the book of Philippians today, we have serious reasons to again look at how do we shine? How do we shine in this present perverse generation? How do we shine? By simply shining the life light. By simply engaging in, in services that helps other souls to find the truth. There are some persons that we may not touch, but because the person we have touched, the person that is life has been affected by us, will go all the way to affect them. You see them being dragged into the same fold in which God has brought us. Now, to conclude for this segment this afternoon, I want us to now cast a little eye on the Paul. Let's look at Paul's life. We can't finish Paul's life, but we can just look a little out of it. Just a little. Uh, because I'm trusting God that by the time we are coming back to conclude, we will only be concluding on, so what are the practical things to write away from here and do for God? Now in chapter 3, chapter 3, something that uh, I know you know before, but which I want to highlight 
in the life, in the discipleship life of Paul. Yeah, from verse uh, 3. We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I am also circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted laws for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the laws of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's the first thing that I would like to highlight about Paul. Paul was a man who came into discipleship with an intense hunger for God. Paul was one man where he did not know the truth. He was zealous according to the law of his fathers. Where he had not met the truth, he was ready to die for what he knew. He was blind and he was doing everything he could the Bible says he said he thought it was his responsibility to persecute this way. So he even went and took permission that anywhere he found uh, disciples gathering, he is going to dislodge them, drag them to the prison, beat them. And that was what he began to do. But when Jesus arrested him on the road to Damascus, something changed about his life. But it is not his dramatic uh, encounter that is the point. There are many people that have had dramatic encounter and they went about telling the story of that uh, encounter, but nothing else about their lives. That's not what is attracting my attention about Paul. It is at that moment that he encountered Jesus, he asked two questions, two prominent and pertinent questions. Lord, who are you? Who are you, Lord? And when you say, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest, the next question is, like, what will you have me do? Two important questions in the life of Paul. But I found that those questions were not just questions that was answered at once. Who are you, Lord, is a quest for knowing the Lord. Forgetting to know who this Jesus is. And that curse for knowing God, that hunger for knowing who Jesus is, followed Paul from that road to Damascus until his death. The hunger to know Christ, the hunger to be intimate with Christ, the hunger to, to want to experience Christ, he said, for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, I count all things lost. I'm ready to throw everything away that I may know him. And you know that that verse 10 that said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection was a popular quote that we quote about Paul. But it was not just a quotation. That was a slight long passion. I want to know Christ. Now, a disciple that will shine forth must have an unquenchable hunger for God, an unquenchable progressive hunger, a desire to know Jesus much more, much more personally, much more intimately, much more, you know, intentionally. 
I saw that in the life of Paul. And I saw that that was why his influence was very overwhelming. If we are disciples and our hunger for Jesus is not progressing, we we'll look like as if we are just a wheelbarrow. But there's no man that sought the Lord with all his heart that God will not reveal himself to him. God will reveal himself, he will show himself to us. Now the second question in the life of Paul that he asked, I will leave that a discussion for our final session. Lord, what will you have me do? Every disciple must be eager to know what the will of God for his life should be. If we are raising disciples, we are sitting with them, we are having the fellowship in the gospel, and they are not helped to find out what will the Lord have them do. How will the Lord have their lives to also be poured into the purpose of God? How will they contribute their own lives also into the kingdom of God? Their discipleship will be endless. It will be as if we are just running around a cycle. The purpose of discipleship, as we saw it, Jesus said, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. What he will have them do was inherent in their discipleship. So also, as we begin to raise disciples, as we begin to meet with people, we must from the onset begin to find out, Lord, what will you have me do? What will you have this man do? What will you have this woman do? What will you have this young man do in life? This is part of discipleship. If we are raising disciples and we are not helping them to find out what is it that they were captured by Jesus Christ for, we have not helped them much. So Paul said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And the Bible said, it shall be told you. God said, go into that city ahead of you. It will be told you what you will do. I will yet appear to you on the things I want you to do for me. Thank God for several of us that God has brought into this relationship. He has brought us to himself in a way and we have seen the need for us to see a move of God, a revival breaking forth in Europe, beginning from the UK by the grace of God. And we have been speaking about this in the midst of all conflicts. We have seen that God is committed into saying, into doing what he has been saying. He said, we may not see wind, we may not see rain, but this valley will be filled with water. God who watches over his word to bring it to pass, has done several in different ways, in different parts, in different portions. But here we now stand. Paul said, Lord, what will you have me to do? That question was what he began to pursue from that point forward. So when we come back and we're looking at how do we go on? How do we pursue what God has set for us? What are the practical things that God will have us to do from now on? I'm trusting that as we kick off from Paul's example, we'll see what we can do in the UK, what we can do in Europe, what we can do in our different contexts by the grace of God. So I'd like us to stop at this point and pray together again. Let's pray together. Timothy was an example. Epaphroditus was an example. Luke was an example of what we can do. And then we have seen Paul, a man with an unquenchable thirst to know Jesus. Let's pray that our own lives also will become an example among believers. We also will become an example that others can see. And that Lord, even though the ground looks dry, even though it looks as if, oh, we're walking in a contest that is looking difficult, there is still an open door for us. Lord, please help us. Help our lives to walk with you. Let your spirit come upon us in a new way. Thank you because you will do beyond what we can ask or imagine today. In Jesus Christ's name, we have. 
Amen and amen. Uh, men and brethren are still in the attitude of prayer. I just want us to take a moment or two to still pray. Uh, God in his mercies has shown us uh, great examples, even from his word, again this morning, this afternoon, uh, concerning how all of these great men uh, engage in discipleship. Timothy, we saw the example of Timothy, the example of Paul. We saw all of this example, and God is giving us a sample for us to work as uh, using them as a template, even for our own lives. And as instructed and you know indicated in the message, even though I have not joined, but I am going to, you know, just stand in here to ask us to pray together. Uh, that the kind of love that God you know, instituted in the heart of those brethren that caused them to work together as brothers and sisters. They related in love. Uh, they were genuinely concerned for one another. Uh, they loved each other deeply uh, with the love of Christ. And because of that, uh, there wasn't any sense of superiority or inferiority complex. Uh, the whole work in the same fold with the love of Christ in their heart and related together, watching over each other, and they were all growing, becoming more and more like Jesus. Can I ask us to pray that the Lord will pour upon us such a love? And the Bible says that the love of Christ constrained us. Other translation of that scripture says the, the love of Christ leaves us with no choice. Uh, that we don't have any other choice but to love the way Christ loved and to walk together and to relate together in one accord, in one spirit, that God will institute genuine love in our heart. Men and brethren, let's pray together this morning, this afternoon. Let's beg God that even all of this example that God has even brought to us, uh, that this will not just be a mess, another message that we're just hearing, but the specific instruction that God has brought to us, uh, we will receive them with meekness and we will trust God to make them become the living reality of our own lives. That each and every one of us will run with this instruction and take responsibility even to deliberately engage in discipleship so that what God has here meant to do under this open heaven uh, in our own time will not be truncated. And that even as God has brought another visitation, another revival in our own time, that our disobedience will not be the reason why this will stop. Can we beg God? Let's pray together, brethren. Father, we thank you. We give you praise, oh God, for this opportunity. Ah, even to sit together all around the world. Lord, and many are connecting on different platforms, even on YouTube, on Facebook, on Telegram, on, on Mixella, and on Zoom. Lord, you are not doing all of this for nothing. It is because you are, of, you are preparing us for a global revival that is already upon us. And you are giving us a template even to work with by showing us the examples of disciples in the word of God, the way they operated, the way they worked together, the way they related in love. Father, we pray, O oh God, that that in that you did, Lord God, in there, that made them to walk together in oneness, that made them to walk together in love. We pray, oh God, that you will do the same in our own lives, in our own heart, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that none of us here, we miss out even on all that we are, Lord God, doing at this time. None of us, oh God, will be left behind, but Lord, you will prevail over our heart. Lord, you will do away with every element of the flesh you will ever quit, oh God. That thing, oh God, that usually hinders a man from working with God. 